All right, this is the introduction to maximum likelihood estimation and optimization. So from last time, we talked about these random utility models, uh, which can be broken into two parts, things we can observe and things we can't observe, the error term. We also said that the parts that we can observe can be defined as a function of the product attributes. Uh, so if we had something like a, a car, the x1 might be price, x2 might be color, and so on. And what we want to know is these beta parameters. We want to know what are the value of these coefficients um, so that can tell us the relative value of, of attributes of the product. And we're going to estimate that using maximum likelihood estimation. Um, so to understand that, we have to first understand what is a likelihood function. And then we have to understand how to maximize it. And that's a process of optimization. So the likelihood function is a function of the parameters of a statistical model given observed data. Uh, so let's unpack this, and I, I like to start with probability. A probability is, is about saying, given known parameters, that's what this bar here means, given these parameters theta, we can ask questions like, what is the probability of a random parameter equaling a particular value? So let's look at an example. Let's look at a standard normal distribution. Uh, and in this distribution, it has a mean, a uh, mean set at zero, and a standard deviation of one. And so this is the probability density function. And we can ask, uh, for example, what is the probability that uh, this random variable equals zero? Well, to answer that, we just read off of this probability density function. And it's about 0.4. So at x is zero, the value is about 0.4. So that's probability. In likelihood, we don't know the parameters, but we do have some observations uh, observations from the random variable. So for example, let's say we know that our random variable follows a normal distribution and we got these 10 values, uh, these 10 observations. Well then we were going to ask the question, what is the likelihood that the true parameters are 0 and 1? And the probability of any one of these values occurring, well that we can calculate by just looking at the PDF. Right, so the probability of this first observation occurring is 0.39. That's just reading off of the PDF of, of our distribution here. And so we can do that for every single observation we have. Right, this is the probability of each of these observations occurring. And then the likelihood is just the multiplication of all of these probabilities together. Because remember, these are independent events. So when things are independent, the joint probability is just the multiplication of all of these individual probabilities. So in this case, the likelihood is 1.63 times 10 to the negative 6. Now that value doesn't really have any directly interpretable meaning, uh, but we'll see on the next slide here how we're going to use this. Now before we go on, we're going to make one more adjustment, which is to take the log of the likelihood, which converts multiplication to addition. The reason we want to do this is because when you're multiplying a lot of small numbers together, like we're doing here to get the likelihood, we end up with a very small number. And if we had even more observations and we multiply them together, this number might just converge to zero. So if you remember from your log rules that taking the log of a bunch of things multiplied together is the same as adding them together uh, in the log space. So when you add these small numbers together, you get three. So this gives us something that we can now work with. We can compare um, log likelihoods across different uh, types of parameters. So maximum likelihood estimation is about finding the set of parameters that produces the highest log likelihood value. Using this same example, we could take a set of parameters, uh, compute the probabilities of observing each of those observations, and add them up, and we'll get a log likelihood value. We could then do that again for different sets of parameters, and we'd get different values of log likelihood. Now in this case, the middle row has the higher log likelihood value of three. So we can say that this is more likely to be the true set of parameters. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the best set of parameters, but that's the goal here of maximum likelihood estimation. Um, you're gonna be looking through different sets of parameters to try to find the one that produces the highest log likelihood. So for practice question one, Let's say we know that the height of students, uh, a random variable x, in a classroom follows a normal distribution. A professor obtains the above height measurements 
measured in inches, and what is the log likelihood value that x follows a normal distribution with a mean of 68 and a standard deviation of 4. I've given you a few hints here of how to calculate the log likelihood and also the d norm function in R uh, is a function that returns the value of f of x for a normal distribution with a given mean and standard deviation. Second question, compute the log likelihood value using the same standard deviation but now with different values of the means ranging from 66 up to 70. How do the different results compare and which value for the mean would produce the highest log likelihood? In general, what we're trying to do is use the data we observe to estimate these unknown parameters of an assumed model. And so in this case, this likelihood function, we're trying to maximize that with respect to these parameters. The parameters, uh, theta here, a vector of unknown parameters. Well, this is really an optimization problem. So to understand how we're going to do this, we got to learn some general principles about optimization. In optimization, we're trying to find the values x that maximize a function of x. So, so let's start with an example. Let's say that we are going to a company and we want to maximize our profit. The profit function is a function of three things, price and cost and q or quantity. The quantity to the demand is a function of the price, 10 minus p. So if we want to maximize our profit, we want to find the right price that gives us the most profit. We rewrite this formally by saying maximize the profit with respect to p price is the unknown parameter we're trying to solve for, subject to, in this case, we add this constraint where price has to be greater than or equal to zero. We can't have a negative price. Well, one of the first steps in solving this is to just rewrite this problem. Since demand is a function of price, well, then we can substitute that in and reformulate the equation for profit. So it turns out that profit is a quadratic equation with this uh, function. So it's a function of price and cost. If cost is set to 1, then this is the profit curve we're going to be looking at. And so it's pretty obvious, visually, you can tell where the optimal price is. It's somewhere right about here. But if you remember your calculus, you'll also note that at that point, the peak of this curve, the line tangent to the curve has a slope of 0. And remember that the line tangent to a curve is the derivative of the function. So the derivative of this profit function, in this case, is negative 2p plus 10 plus c. All I did was differentiate this, this function here. If that step seems uh, confusing to you, go back and review your calculus rules to understand how we got from here to here. Since we know that at this point the derivative is 0, then we can just set this derivative equal to 0 and solve for p. Solving for p gives us this equation, 10 plus c over 2. This is telling us that the optimal price is a function of the cost. So in this plot here, where cost is equal to 1, the optimal price is 5.5. Now the reason this worked was because we knew the function. I could write it out. It was a pretty simple example. But we want to identify more broadly some general principles in optimization, and that's what we're going to use going forward. There are a few conditions to know that we're at an optimum value. One of the first ones we just saw from the previous example is that the slope of a line tangent to the curve is equal to zero. This is known as the first order necessary condition. In this example here, we see three stationary points where the slope is zero. The second order condition helps us understand whether the stationary point is a maximum or a minimum. It is a maximum when the second derivative is less than zero. What does that mean? Well, the second derivative tells us something about the curvature. So let's look at this point here. The curvature at this point is negative. That's what the second derivative is, helps us understand. It tells us something about the nature of the curvature. So if you have a negative curvature, that means you're going up to a point and then coming back down. So that suggests you're at a maximum. Both of these are local maximum. A minimum is just the opposite. The second derivative, or the curvature, is positive. So here we see a positive curvature. That is a local minimum. 
I like to imagine smiley faces to help me distinguish between these two. A negative curvature looks is negative means it's a frowny face, whereas a positive curvature, positive smiley face. Notice that the word local is in each of these definitions. A local minimum, for example, just means that at that point, it's lower than any of the neighboring points to the left or right. Likewise, a local maximum is locally, that point is greater than the points to the immediate left or right. A global max means that of all the different stationary points, it is the highest. Note, I don't have a global min listed here because this local min is already higher than any of these points down here. So the global minimum is probably somewhere further down and off this chart. There's a third case where the second derivative is equal to zero. In that case, it looks something like this, and this is known as an inflection point, where the curvature is initially negative, and then on this side, the curvature is positive. And so you're not really at a min or max. So let's review the optimality conditions for just a local maximum. The first order condition is that the derivative has to equal zero. That means the slope of the line tangent at that point is zero. And the second order condition says that the second derivative has to be negative or has a negative curvature. If those two conditions are met, then we're at a local maximum. Now, if we have multiple dimensions, let's say we have a figure that looks like this. Here we have an x1 and x2. Well, there's analogous conditions to the single dimension. The first order condition says that the gradient has to be equal to zero. The gradient is the vector of partial derivatives with respect to each individual parameter. In this case, we're looking at a tangent plane. So in the one dimension, it's a line. The slope of a line has to be zero. In this case, the slope of the plane that cuts through the x1 and x2 space has to be zero. The second order condition says that the Hessian, or the matrix of second derivatives, has to be negative definite. Now, we're not going to get into the details of what makes a Hessian negative definite, but just understand that it has an analogous meaning as a negative curvature. Whereas here, a negative curvature means we're at a peak, while a negative definite Hessian means that we're also at a peak in a multidimensional space. Keep in mind, this is only two dimensions here, x1 and x2, but for other problems, we can have even more uh, dimensions that just gets harder to visualize. For a local minimum, the second order condition flips. It has to have a positive curvature in a one-dimensional space, or likewise, in a multidimensional space, the Hessian has to be positive definite, or has this kind of bowl shape. As a general convention, when we're doing optimization, we rewrite problems in a standard notation form known as negative null form. So oftentimes you'll have a problem where you want to maximize the value of f, and we just rewrite that as minimizing the negative of f. This is still going to produce the same solution, the same x value, but this is a convention. So from now on you're going to see the rest of this presentation uh, present, presenting problems as minimization problems. Now there's two general ways to solve optimization problems, analytic and algorithmic. In analytical optimization, we just compute the derivative and second derivatives directly to check these optimality conditions. For example, let's find what values of x will maximize the function negative x squared plus 6x. So here I'm going to write that in negative null form as minimizing the negative of f, which is x squared minus 6, with respect to x. The function looks like this. The first order condition says the derivative has to be equal to 0. Well, the derivative here is simply 2x minus 6. If we set it equal to 0, we can find that the optimal value is at 3. Now, visually, we could stop here and say, oh, it looks like it's when x is 3, you're at the minimum. But let's make sure we check our second order condition. In this case, the second derivative is 2, which is positive. And when the curvature is positive, remember, a happy smiley face, you're at the bottom of a curve, which means you're at a minimum. So our first and second order conditions are met. The optimal value is when x is 3.
Now this was a relatively simple example where we could easily compute the first and second derivatives, but sometimes it's not so easy to compute those and it's hard to visualize and understand what's going on in the function. And so in those cases, we'll often use algorithms to help us solve these problems. There are many different optimization algorithms available. I'm going to illustrate just one known as the gradient descent method. We start by choosing a starting point, x0. At that point, we then compute the gradient, and then we take a step in the direction of the gradient. We pick a step size, this value gamma, and we move down the gradient. So the gradient descent gets its name from moving down the gradient. Then we just repeat the process again. At x1, we compute the gradient, and we make another step. And then at that point, we compute the gradient, and we make another step. Until finally, we hit a point where we reach some stopping criteria. Two general stopping criteria are when, one, when the gradient is very close to zero. So we choose a very small number, and we check if the gradient is less than that number. Or when the difference between the x we were just at and the x of the new step is very small. Once we're down to the bottom of this curve, the differences in each step are going to be very tiny. And so when either of these conditions are met, we might stop our algorithm. Now an important limitation of using algorithms like this is that sometimes they can be sensitive to the starting point. If I chose a starting point over here, for example, well, the gradient moves down in this direction, so I may completely miss this value and I might go off in a different direction. So sometimes you have to check different starting points to see whether you're at a local minimum or a global minimum. Some functions have the convenient property of being convex or concave. A convex function means that it's bowl-shaped. If we pick any two points along the function and we draw a line between them, they're always going to be above the function. When minimizing a convex function, any local minimum is also a global minimum. In this case, we could pick a starting point anywhere we want, and we would always follow down the curve to this point at the bottom. Concave functions are just the opposite. If you draw a line between any two points, every point along those lines are below the curve. When maximizing a concave function, any local maximum is also a global maximum. This is a convenient property that we're going to use later on. So for practice question two, consider the following function, which has the following gradient. Using the starting point of x equals 1 and the step size of 0 0.3, apply the gradient descent method to compute the next three points in the search algorithm. Remember, the gradient descent method is just taking your current starting point and then subtracting the step size times the gradient at that point. For question three, we're going to do the similar process, but in this case, we have a two-dimensional function, x1 and x2. Using the starting points x1 is equal to 1 and x2 is equal to 1, and the step size of 0.15, apply the gradient descent method again to compute the next three points in the search algorithm. Remember the gradient descent method, and in R, you can use the C function to create a vector of two values. All right, so last slide, let's go all the way back and tie everything together. Remember we had this concept of utility, which we said can be broken into two components, the observable side and the unobservable side. Well, the observable can be broken into these uh, beta times x components, where betas are unknown coefficients, and x are these attributes of a, of a product. And in short notation, we write this whole side, the observable utility, as beta prime x where beta is a vector of, of multiple betas, and x is the matrix of data. This is a matrix notation of, of writing out this whole uh, sum product here. And we said we're going to estimate this beta, this vector of coefficients, by maximizing the likelihood function. So let's write this in negative null form. So maximizing the log likelihood is the same as minimizing the negative log likelihood, uh, which here is just a summation of all these different probabilities, uh, p sub j, which is a function of these unknown beta parameters and our data x, all uh, raised to the power of y sub i. And y sub i is just a dummy variable. It takes 1 if the alternative j was chosen and 0 otherwise. So
when you raise something to the power of zero, it's equal to one. So what this is really saying is this is the probability of the chosen alternative j. Now remember for a logit model, the probability of choosing an alternative from a set of alternatives can be written with this fraction term, where we take the exponentiation of the observed utility, this v sub j, and we divide it by uh, the summation of this same value for all the alternatives in the choice set. And so this v sub j, as we wrote over here, uh, is just beta primes x. So finally, this is the fraction we're going to put in to this p sub j term here. The probabilities of making choices is going to be defined as these uh, fraction terms. And keep in mind here, the only thing we don't know is the beta coefficient, right? x is the data. This is the observable attributes of our choices, of our uh, alternatives. And we're trying to figure out what are the coefficients that go in this beta term um, that maximize the likelihood, or in this case, minimizing the negative likelihood. So that's the whole process of how we're going to take this utility model here, these beta prime x terms, and use maximum likelihood estimation to estimate our vector of coefficients. Because at the end of the day, this is what we're trying to understand is what are these parameters? So we'll get into this next time in class where we'll start actually estimating these models in R.